Welcome to Uplift Community Podcast. I'm Amanda Freebaron and I'm your host for today. And today I'm going to be talking to Troy Russell. Um, Troy, thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Troy is going to be talking uh, to us today about his faith and especially regarding a great trial of faith that he and his family had in their lives when they um, lost their nine-year-old son, Austin. Um, but first, Troy, can you please introduce yourself and your family. Yes, uh, my name is Troy Russell, and I was born in Dayton, Ohio, um, with a f uh, eight kids in our family, so we had a big family, and my father was in the Air Force, so we moved around quite frequently. I graduated from high school in Mesa, Arizona at a school called Mountain View. I uh, went to Ricks College for a year, and then I served a mission in Perth, Australia, and came home and attended Weber State, and I met my wife, uh, Deidre Valentine. And um, we have five beautiful children, Colin, Kyler, uh, Austin, Peyton, and Madeline. And we currently live in Henderson, Nevada, where I'm a chiropractic physician. Okay, thank you. And can you tell us a little bit uh, about your son, Austin? Tell us about what, what was he like? So Austin was uh, this most amazing, cute little kid. Any room he went in, he had this smile that lit up the whole room. Uh, he, was, he was short for his age, but he was an incredible athlete. So uh, he played a lot of sports, and whenever he played, parents from both teams would keep their eye on Austin just because of how good he was. And uh, loved basketball, uh, loved football he would constantly shoot baskets. We had a little basketball hoop in our house. We had a papa shot, uh, basketball hoop uh, in our pool out in the backyard. And he would just kind of rotate through all the, the baskets and shoot probably 500 to 1,000 shots a day. And he couldn't quit unless it was on an even number. For example, uh, my wife would tell him to come in for dinner and he'd tell me at three, four years old, he'd tell me that he'd made 76 shots and he couldn't come until he made a hundred. <laughs> wow. He, she wasn't happy because she went in for dinner. And as a, as a father who loves sports, I was like, yes, yeah, son, keep shooting. <laughs> <laughs> Very determined and dedicated. That's really impressive. Can you tell us about um, the day that Austin passed away? Yeah. So uh, it was May 30th, 2015. And, um, that night, the night before, I remember he asked to spend the night at a friend's house. And I was sitting at my, my desk and I told him if he came over and gave me a big hug, he could. And I gave him a big hug and I just said, Do you know how much your dad loves you? And he said, yeah, with a big smile and hugged me. And then he went and spent the night at his friend's house. The, the next morning we had basketball. He had a, a tryout for a basketball league he was getting ready to play in and so I took him to that that tryout and he brought his best friend with him or one of his best friends and I came home that day and then we started cleaning out the garage and the garage was about oh 80 90 percent done and the stuff we were cleaning out we were getting rid of we we're going to donate and we were walking to the street where my truck was parked to uh, put the stuff in the back of the truck and for unknown reasons I felt like why don't we back the truck into the driveway so we don't have to walk as far which was kind of you know futile because it, the truck was already 80 85 percent full but back the truck in we finished loading it full of stuff and finished cleaning out the garage let me add something to that a few probably 15 minutes earlier before we finished uh, we ordered pizza and we were sitting at the table eating pizza and my nephew, Michael Russell, had just opened his mission call and it was on Facebook. And so I watched it and then I went into the kitchen of the boys, Austin and Kyler, where they're eating pizza. And I showed them the video of Michael opening his mission call. And I said to Kyler and Austin, I said, before you know it, this is going to be you guys serving your missions. And then finished eating and finished the garage. Uh, I'd gotten in the truck, started the car. I was backed in the driveway, and 
I pulled forward and I felt the truck go over something. And my initial thought was that something had fallen out of the back. And I looked back and saw my precious little boy lying on the ground. And I was, I was, I was just in shock. I didn't know. I just yelled to my wife. And um, she'd called 911 and, and the paramedics came and um, apparently he was, uh, he had dropped a chapstick and he was reaching for a chapstick as, as I was pulling forward. And uh, after that, it was just, a, a, it was a kind of a blur. My, my perfect world, um, couldn't picture better career, better family, better life, better friends. Just this perfect world I had all of a sudden and just this instant was turned upside down. And um, I was, uh, and initially a police officer came and had me in the car and, and my wife went with my son to the hospital. And after they questioned me for a little bit, uh, they took me down to the hospital and, and I went into a room where they had his body and, and they told me that he'd passed away. I remember my wife and I were just alone in there and I uh, didn't know what to, to feel, what to think, what to do. It just seemed like this horrible dream we just wanted to wake up from or a horrible, you know, if you play a game, you reset it. You, you just, it just didn't seem, it just didn't seem uh, uh, real, but we just didn't want to leave his body in there. And we had amazing friends that, that came down to the hospital. Uh, one of them, particularly Tom Welch, is a nurse anesthetist, and he was able to come in and and just came in and gave me a big hug, and I just remember just breaking down. And uh, from that moment on, it it just, as I said, our life was just completely changed upside down. And um, it was an experience I can't even I can't even really describe it there. There was no, um, I couldn't close my eyes. I couldn't sleep for the first few days. Anytime I closed my eyes, I just saw my precious little boy lying there, uh, like in a high definition, huge screen TV. Anytime I closed my eyes, that's what I saw. Um, no joy in life. Uh, normal activities that, that you tend to enjoy, sleeping, a good meal, uh, a joke, a book, a TV show, just anything in life. There was absolutely no, uh, no, no joy at all. But um, yeah, I mean, there, there's just so many, so many things, so many feelings. I just, I don't know if I can really portray, go through it all. I ho hopefully that answered your question. Obviously, this is kind of every parent's worst nightmare. It's the worst thing that you could imagine really happening. And, and you mentioned how it kind of sucked the joy out of everything. And I imagine it also made it difficult to kind of just generally function normally. What did people do, your loved ones, your ward members, um, what did people do to minister to you at this time that was um, effective in sort of supporting your family through this trial? So the, the outreaching of, of love and support we, we received was um, just amazing. Initially, uh, you know, people trying to call or text, but I, we didn't, I didn't answer, didn't respond to anything, but just we had about six to eight neighbors at the hospital there with us. And then that night, my brother from St. George and his wife drove down and took our other kids. We had meals brought to us for about six months by people in our neighborhood and our ward and our community. People just dropping by. I remember our bishop had just been called as bishop and we didn't really know him and he's a young guy and he used to come over every night and just hang out with our family. Didn't say anything, didn't I mean, he did say things, but it wasn't like he was there trying to give us some amazing words, just, just him being there. Just showed us the love that he had for us. People dropping off gifts, books, audio talks, cards. Uh, we got a lot of flowers and 
I, to this day, I still hate flowers. I got so many flowers and, and every time I eat flowers, it just reminds me of that. And I, I just, I never want to see another flower in my life, but we appreciated everything. I, <clears throat> my wife and I didn't feel like doing anything there, there. As I told you earlier, there's no joy in life. There was no happiness with anything that we did. And so we made a little pact with each other that if anyone invited us to do anything that we had to say yes. And so whether it was friends inviting us to go out to lunch or to stop by, we just had to say yes. We have uh, amazing uh, friends, the Avilas, Jamie and Danielle Avila. And they had um, rented a uh, place in Hawaii that they were going to take uh, one of their mothers and their family for a vacation. And, and she couldn't go because of health problems. And they, they said they'd like to fly our family to Hawaii and go on a vacation. And even though we didn't feel like doing that, uh, we said yes, just because of the pact we made. And, and they flew our family to Hawaii with them for a week and we had a vacation. And we were frequently told that people would say, make sure you keep doing things for your other kids, which we knew that was right. But it, it was like a, one of my arms was ripped off and then being told, go to the beach and have a great time for your legs and your other arm. You know, it just didn't, it, it didn't feel like we were whole or complete. And so it was hard to even do anything without, without Austin. Uh, we had, uh, soon after Austin passed away, our, I think our washing machine broke and neighbors found out about it, or people in the neighborhood, I'm not even sure who, and they all pitched in and, and showed up one day with a new washer and dryer and they had it installed. Before Austin passed away, my wife had talked to a friend of ours who did plumbing saying she wanted a large kitchen sink and they pitched in and came in one day and installed a large kitchen sink. And even though none of those single acts, you know, could change what had happened or take away the pain, it was just the love that we felt from everybody. And I've, I've really learned that, that after this, the time where the pain was the most is when we were by ourselves, but when we had distractions, people over, stopping by, visiting, dropping things off, calling us, sending messages, it was a nice distraction to kind of help us avoid the, some of the intense pain we were experiencing. And then the, the church did the video about our home teacher. I, I regularly played basketball before and after Austin passed away, that was the furthest thing from my mind is going to start playing basketball, especially because that was a such a special bond I have with my boys, uh, including Austin uh, uh, playing basketball. So that was it. I had one uh, friend reach out to me that I hadn't talked to in years and told me that he'd actually uh, stopped attending church and was contemplating leaving his wife and kids. And, and through the event with Austin passing away, he said it made him reevaluate his life and what was really important in life. And he told us that he knew that that didn't you know, that wouldn't bring back Austin or anything, but he just wanted to let us know how it affected him. And I got quite a few messages of things similar to that. At, at the time, it didn't really ease any of our, our pain. But looking back as a picture of a whole with, with all the messages and everything we received, I, the, the best way I can describe it is it felt like a house was on top of us. And no matter what we did, we could not budge it. We couldn't move it. We couldn't breathe. We couldn't. It was just suffocating. And all of a sudden, this house slowly is getting lifted off a little bit. And when we look, it's, it's all our, our neighbors, friends, strangers. Everyone's reached in and is slowly lifting this house up off us. Uh, but there's so many more things I'm, I'm, I'm missing that, that people did for our family. I think that sometimes when we're wanting to minister to people who are going through tragedies, at least for me, I have felt nervous about approaching someone who's gone through something hard because I'm worried that I'm going to say the wrong thing. And in fact, I just had lunch the other day with a friend of mine who had just gotten a divorce. And she said that 
all the time people would just, she would run into people and they knew what had happened and they would just pretend like nothing happened. And she said that she understood why people, that people were just afraid of hurting her by saying the wrong thing, but that saying kind of nothing and ignoring it felt actually a lot worse. Does that kind of hold true to you, your experience? Did you just feel like you appreciated everyone's efforts or I don't know, what would you say to someone who was nervous about trying to help someone who is going through something like this and just didn't know what to say? Because there's nothing obviously you can say to make it better. Yeah. The, it's better for people to, to say things to us. The, the best for people would come up and just hug us or when, when we would see their, you know, their, especially when they come up and hug us and, and have tears in their eyes and how it affected them. Uh, it, it was much better to, to just come and let us know that they love us or they're thinking of us or they're hurting too. The thing that was the worst thing people could say is come up to us and say, you know, sorry, you're going through this, but look at all the good it's doing. Look at all the good mm. that from this. That, even though we knew their intentions were good, right? that's not what we... Um, what we wanted to, to hear. Right. But yeah, just e ignoring us was, was not good, but just letting us know that they loved us or they were thinking of us or cared about us uh, was very helpful. Okay. Um, so one thing I wanted to uh, ask you about um, in Uplift when we have people who are struggling with their faith. One of the biggest challenges, and I think this is universal for all Christian denominations, all faiths of any kind, people struggle with the idea of the problem of pain and evil. Like why would God, a loving God, allow bad things to happen? I personally can't imagine something much worse than, than a situation where a parent would see their, their child die at a young age um, I can't imagine much worse pain than that. How do you make sense of this question in light of lo losing your son in such a young age? You know, it's, it's a really interesting question, and, and I've, I've heard that a lot. It's actually the, the opposite. Because our Heavenly Father loves us, He allows us to go through struggles, trials, uh, difficult things. If, if you remember in the pre-existence, there were two plans presented. There was Satan's, which his was, we'll come down here. There won't be any struggle, any trial, wouldn't be any horrible deaths. There wouldn't be any losing jobs. There wouldn't be anyone unkind. Every, everyone would be perfect, nice, and we'd all return back to our Heavenly Father. But yet the problem with that is we wouldn't grow. We wouldn't learn. And we did not choose that plan. And with our Heavenly Father's plan, all the struggles and pain and trials and everything we go through is it's for our learning, our experience, our, our growth. And, and because Heavenly Father loves us, he allows us to go through these, these struggles and difficult trials. Now, if I, if I had the belief that this life was it, yeah, losing my son would be horrible and there'd be no getting over it. But because I know that this life is just a schooling, it's to give us experience. It's, it gives us opportunities to use the only thing we truly own, which is our agency. And uh, if I look at, I mean, you look at the history of the, the pioneers or Joseph Smith or even Jesus Christ. I mean, look what he, look what he suffered. We want to be like our savior, but yet we don't want to go through any of the struggles or trials that he went through. Uh, Joseph Smith and his wife, I believe they lost like their first five children. And, you know, he was chosen as a, as a prophet of God, uh, yet everything that he went through. So but what, what I've really come to know through that is because our Heavenly Father loves us, he allows us to experience these difficult trials and struggles, and it allows us to use our agency. So as I said earlier, the only thing I, I believe we truly own is our agency. My, I'll tell you a little story. When I, I got home from my mission, my father... He said, when you meet a girl that you want to marry, he 
you know, he goes, take her out to a really nice restaurant and then accidentally spill a drink on her and see how she reacts. <laughs> he said, then you'll know what kind of person she is. <laughs> Obviously, I never, I never did that. But I believe that's what this life is. Life is about us getting sometimes little drinks spilled on us, sometimes huge drinks. But what it does, it allows us to use our agency and make choices. We can either become better and draw ourselves closer to our Heavenly Father, or we can um, push ourselves further away and, and kind of use Satan's thought and say, well, if God was there, he wouldn't allow this, this bad thing to happen. If you really think about that train of thought, if we never want to lose a job, we never want to um, get hurt, we never want to get sick, we never want to get betrayed, we never, we never want to have anything bad happen to us. But yet, if someone lived their whole life without any struggles, trials, difficulty, I, I don't think there'd be any, be any growth. And it's for these very reasons that I believe that, that we're here. And, and through the loss of, of Austin and, and the most pain I'd ever experienced in my life, I can honestly tell you that at the same time, I never felt more love from our Heavenly Father. I felt never closer to our Savior. And it's really hard to describe the feelings. There was no pain or, or no joy in life and so much pain. But yeah, at the same time, I never felt more love uh, than as we were going through all that. Can I, sorry, can I share one other? Yeah, of course. One other thing, along with what I was saying, there's one of my favorite scriptures is in uh, Ether. It's where Moroni is speaking. And he, uh, or the Lord, he's, he's quoting the Lord. And the Lord says, um, if men come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. Now, a lot of times I've interpreted that in the past as weaknesses. Like I'm not strong enough. I'm not fast enough. I'm not a great speaker. I'm not good looking enough. Like those weaknesses. Um, but I've come to learn that that weakness is referring just to our, our mortal bodies. Everything that comes along with it, uh, addictions, um, sicknesses, uh, uh, death, all the things that come from us being mortal. So he says, if men will come unto, I will show unto them their weakness. I give unto men weakness that they may be humble. So we're given these mortal bodies to go through all the struggles that we go through. Um, even even struggling with our faith or uh, with disease or illnesses or addictions. And they're given to us that we might be humble, that we might draw ourselves closer to our Heavenly Father. And I found in my own life, when, when my life is going great, my, my prayers aren't as intense or passionate. Uh, I just kind of get in a rut, just kind of going through the motions. But when I'm really struggling in life, that's when I really become more humble and draw myself closer to our Heavenly Father. So ultimately, our weaknesses, our, our physical bodies, and all the struggles that come with it are actually, it's a blessing to try to help us draw closer to our Heavenly Father. Wow, I'm sorry. I get getting a little choked up. So I'm sorry for the pauses. Um, but I really appreciate you sharing that that reminder that uh, the purpose of this life is not necessarily to have ease um, and that struggles help us to become humble and rely more on our Heavenly Father. Um, you're, you're exactly right. And, and I would like to say one more thing with that is we volunteered and chose to come down here knowing all the stuff we go through we didn't we didn't come down here thinking man this is going to be easy life but yet we all shouted for joy and we did that because we knew of the overall growth and uh, experience that we get from this life i love that the image of of shouting for joy thinking about being able to think about before we came here and having this plan presented to us and we see things right now in such a small limited perspective but to just think of the idea of 
our whole lives and returning to our Heavenly Father, that bringing us joy. I think that gives me, I think, a lot of hope thinking about the trials that I've experienced in my life, that, that this is for, this life is for good. Not necessarily that individual trials. I wouldn't say that someone losing a child is a good thing, but the experience of life as a whole is a good thing and it is a positive. I think, I think when we look back on our lives, we will look at our most trying and struggling times and we'll look back on that as though those were sacred ground for the, the growth and development. We can't do that while we're in the middle of it. You just, it it's just impossible, I think, to look at it that way. Mm-hmm. As we look back, um, we, will, we will look on that as sacred ground, such as if, if I was walking through the Garden of Gethsemane today, I know I'd feel like I was on sacred ground, yet that's where our Savior suffered more than anywhere else. So um, I, I strongly believe that whether 100 years from now, 500 years from now, I don't know when. But I'll look back and I will see what the Lord called my son Austin to do and what he was doing and the work he was doing. And I'll look back at it and think, man, if I could have just seen that, how easy that would have been to get through that trial. And that I wouldn't have wanted it any other way if, if I'm able to see that he's, you know, doing some great work and I'll remember all the pain and the sorrow we felt, but I'll just think, man, that would have been so easy if I could have seen the future and saw what, you know, the big picture of everything. It reminds me of my, my favorite scripture. It's Romans eight eighteen. It says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory, which shall be revealed in us. Okay. So if somebody was experiencing a similar tragedy and were to ask you for comfort or advice or was struggling with their faith in light of something like this, what would you say to them? I will. First of all, I just try to love them. I wouldn't try to judge them for any feelings they have because the the feelings we have, that's why we're here. We're here to joy, experience joy, pain, sorrow, struggle, struggle with our faith. So first of all, I just try to love them and try to understand what they were going through. And then I'd really try to teach them what, what I've learned, that, that we're here to experience that and try to draw closer to Heavenly Father and, and try to realize that because He loves us, He allows us to go through these struggles, and they're ultimately good for us. If we can get through it, just, just keep trying not, not to give up and and anything, I believe, um, I believe anything that encourages us to want to do better, to want to draw closer to Heavenly Father, become a better person, I believe is coming from uh, good, good spirits. Any, any thought that's coming into our mind that, that makes us feel like we're not loved, we're not good enough, uh, we can't be forgiven again because we've repented too many times, I believe those are thoughts that come from uh, evil spirits. And so what I would try to do if someone was struggling, it really would depend on exactly what they're struggling with. But as I said, just love them, not judge them, and try to share my experiences and, and try to help them understand the, the great love our Heavenly Father has for them. Is there anything else that you would like to add to tell our listeners about your experience or how – it has changed you and your family and, and George's people in general struggling with faith. Is there anything you want to add? Um, you know, I can, I can add that we, it's, the evening Austin passed away, um, my whole family was there in the garage except for my oldest son, Colin. He was at a friend's house. And um, when people hadn't told him what had happened. And, and uh, after we got home from the hospital, um, someone brought him over to it. We went to a friend's house um, because the police were doing an investigation in our house and it was all taped off. We, we were at a friend's house, just our family. They'd left us alone. And my son Colin got there and I, we sat down and told him what had happened. And I remember sitting with our family and just telling them how, 
tough it was going to be, but that we needed to make sure that our number one priority is to make sure that we're an eternal family, that we can be together with Austin again, and that we always remember him and, and live our lives in a way that, that we can be together again. And I had learned a lot, you know, being raised in the church and serving a mission. I taught about the atonement of Christ. I had listened to it from the pulpit. I'd learned about it in Sunday school classes and priesthood. And I read about it in the scriptures. But until my son Austin passed away, it was just something I heard or read about. But now it became a reality to me. It, it brought me to the depths of, of sorrow and really got me 100% looking up and saying, I can't do this on my own. And, and I need our Savior in order to, to get through this and in order for our family to be together again. And, and the perfect day for me will be when our, all, our family is all together again. And um, that's, that's our ultimate goal now. It was always our goal before, but it was, as I said, it was kind of maybe something written or something on the wall. Whereas now it's just, it's embedded deep in our, deep in our souls. Thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing your story. Um, I think that it will be very helpful for people who are suffering from various challenges to understand, to hear just someone how, how someone would rely on the atonement. Uh, I think a lot of times we hear in church, use the atonement, use the atonement, use the atonement. But like you said, until it becomes real, it's just kind of words. And then when we, we struggle and we suffer and we, it, does, it d- becomes a real experience, a real action, and that's when we can discover what the atonement is. Uh, or at least a little bit of what the atonement is. Thank you so much for uh, being with us. Is there anything else that you'd like to add before we go? Yeah, I, I do want to uh, just share with you a couple quotes that, that really helped me. Okay. Um, if, if that's all right. With yeah, of course. One was a quote by Joseph Fielding Smith. And he said, no righteous man is ever taken before his time. In the case of the faithful saints, they are simply transferred to other fields of labor. The Lord's work goes on in this life, in the world of spirits, and in the kingdoms of glory where men go after the resurrection. That really let me know that before Austin was loaned to me and my wife as a gift from our Heavenly Father, he's, he's a child of God, and our Heavenly Father loves him uh, even more than we could. And... And that kind of helped with a lot of the thoughts of how could he be taken away. And then the other one is really interesting. I read a, a book by a lady who had a, um, a, a near-death experience. And she, in her book, she, she said this that really, really has helped me. It says, whether we survive the death of loved ones or lose every earthly thing we have, any experience can pull us closer to our Savior or we can push ourselves away from him. We can combine forces with him and thrive or turn our backs and wallow in grief and self-pity for the rest of our mortal lives, widening the spiritual gap and depriving ourselves of true comfort. If we learn to turn it all over to Father in heaven, trusting that his will be done, that everything will work out all right in the end, then we can become one of his soldiers for right and truth, helping him bring to pass miracles and comfort for those on the earth. And that all goes back to our agency. We, we have these tough experiences, but it allows us to use our agency to either become bitter or, or better. And hopefully we can use our experiences